One issue in Canada that does not receive as much attention as it should, but is nonetheless deeply troubling, is the string of historical attacks that have taken place across the country under Justin Trudeau's tenure as Prime Minister. None of this was really anything we ever dealt with in Canada before Justin Trudeau came along. However, statues and monuments have been toppled across the country, names of streets and names of universities have been erased, lies about our country's history have been published, and even Parliament unanimously accepted recently that Canada was guilty of genocide, something that the evidence does not support. And there is no character in Canadian history that has been lied about as often and maligned as viciously as Sir John A. Macdonald. So fittingly, the Trudeau government's decision to renovate and reopen Macdonald's one-time home in Kingston Bellevue House and use it to attack McDonald and attack Canada was fully embraced. And while standing up for the legacies of John A. McDonald, Egerton Ryerson, Wilfrid Laurier, and other great Canadians is no longer politically popular these days, there are some who have not given up the fight. And joining us on the show today is someone who is a very loud and very strong defender of John A. McDonald. So joining us now on the Faulkner Show is Toronto-based lawyer, historian, and writer Greg Piazetsky, who recently wrote in the C2C Journal, Parks Canada tries to cancel Sir John A. Macdonald in his own home. So I just want to begin because I have been to the redesigned Bellevue House and I, like you, was quite shocked at the way the Parks Canada, the way the federal government decided to present Macdonald's legacy. The first question I have for you is why do this to Macdonald's legacy in the first place? It's not the first attack that we've seen on John A. Macdonald and it likely won't be the last, but what benefit does intentionally rewriting and misleading Canadians about McDonald's history bring for our country? Well, I think uh, there's a couple, a couple rationales for it. One of them is a simple one that he was a conservative and we have a liberal government. And I know that sounds pretty trite, but I think that's part of the part of what's going on. Uh, a second issue is a government that wants to remake society. And I, I don't know that they have anyone smart enough to remake our society. Um, but that's the gist of the approach of government to destroy people's belief in themselves and their country, their pride in their country. And once you've done that with people, they become more malleable. Maybe you can pitch them on a new angle. And uh, I don't think it's going to succeed uh, because what they're leaving behind after they have destroyed the past is, is not much for people to go with. People want to have some pride in their country, be proud of what their ancestors have built. So do you think that the people involved in this effort and the renamings, the renaming at universities, the tearing down of McDonald's statues and removing his name from university buildings. Do you think that the people involved in that hate Canada? <laughs> I, I would have to conclude they do, but I don't know if it's what Canada they see because it's not the Canada I know, which I, I love and I love our history. And I believe it's a great history. We're a great example to the world of what can be done by uh, bringing together people from all parts of the world. So it's very, it's very sad to see our government taking this stance. It's rare that uh, people involved in these efforts, and I, I've followed both the McDonald rewriting and the attacks on Egerton Ryerson quite closely. It's rare that those people are so brazen and honest about where they're coming from. But in the case of Bellevue House, at the opening ceremony of Bellevue House, the historian, uh, Shannon Oyenaran, I believe that's her name, she said not only that Canada's history was, quote, steeped in racism and white supremacy, but more to the fact of being as honest as she was, she admitted that the Bellevue House redesign was, quote, a testament to rewriting history. Now, Greg, I know you're a, a historian of sorts. I personally wasn't aware that it was a historian's job to rewrite history, but I assume it is now. What do you make of that? Um, well, there's a lot of it going on today. I mean, I think there's a simple expression that covers it. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts. And I don't care if somebody has a, an opinion contrary to mine. Uh, what I expect, though, is that they'll back it up with some actual facts on the ground. And that's what's missing in this whole discussion, whether it's residential schools or any of the, uh, there are several different initiatives by McDonald's government that saved tens of thousands of native lives. They should be front and center on any discussion of genocide, cultural genocide, real genocide, or uh, even just, you know, attacks on Sir John A. We should, in connection with indigenous issues, we should be looking at the facts. 
and they're not discussed at all. So let's go through the Bellevue House Monument itself. Uh, people who have, who have watched my show closely, they may be aware of my uh, episode that I did on the Bellevue House redesign. But what struck you when you entered the house and when you went on, perhaps you went on a tour, a guided tour as I did, but maybe not. But what, what stood out to you as, as perhaps the most egregious example of this maligning of McDonald's legacy? Well, first of all, let me say I visited... Uh, Bellevue House back in the 1970s with my, not my wife then, she was just a girlfriend, uh, but we lived in Kingston, we were going to Queens and we uh, visited Bellevue House a couple of times actually. So I can say the, the remake is great. It looks, it looks a lot better than it used to look. Uh, they've done a great job. But what the, the politicization of a historic monument, especially one that's actually supposed to be a memorial to Sir John A or a recognition of Sir John A is astounding and it starts with the walkway from the uh, visitor center which is where you buy your tickets and you walk over to the house along a pathway and they've got some signs carrying um, statements that are supposed to be from former visitors but they vary from comments like sir john a was the father of confederation to he was a monster and <laughs> uh that sort of tells you where they're going. That's you, you haven't got to the house yet, and he's being characterized as a monster. Well, you know, that's not an historical term. That's not a term historians use about somebody. They have critiques of somebody. They can talk about his policies, but they don't just dismiss him as a monster. And it goes down. It goes downhill from there in the sense that, well, it doesn't go downhill, but it doesn't get any better. Um, when you go into the house, for example, the dining room, sometimes it's very innocuous. There's indigenous material everywhere. But in the dining room, they have, for example, some herbs, some indigenous herbs sitting in a bowl. Well, uh, you know, that's not too offensive. You can look at it or ignore it. It doesn't make much difference. They have indigenous books, um, of in, uh, books on indigenous art. They're not indigenous books, but they're about indigenous art on the bookshelves. And it's just something you look at and you think, well, that doesn't actually fit very well with McDonald's era or McDonald. Um, but when you, it gets really bad when you go up to, for example, the bedroom in which his child died, his infant, their first child died at the, under the age of one, I think, and died in that house and in a, a crib that they have in that house, which is one of the few original pieces. And that's a very poignant moment for any Canadian to be in that room where he lost his, uh, lost his child and his wife and he shared such uh, pain. Um, but what have they done? They put up an Indian cradle board on the wall, a cradle boards for carrying an, an Indian child, an infant. Um, Indian women carry them on their back in a cradle board. And it's obviously meant to draw, you know, make you think more of indigenous people than of Sir John A and his pain. And in the same room where you're supposed to be feeling this poignancy, I think about Sir John A, they have a nonstop track going where people are complaining about their residential school experience. Like it's really so political, so non-historical, and it's uh, it really shows the bias behind the whole remake. One of the things that struck me when I was in the house was the lack of detail about McDonald's many accomplishments. You would think that that would be, you know, front and center of the house, but there really wasn't much of that. And, you know, almost comically, I found there was a flat screen television above McDonald's bed playing videos that had nothing to do about McDonald and were playing videos, as you mentioned in the article, about, uh, you know, indigenous history and, and things that had nothing to do with them. So there really isn't, it really isn't trying to recreate the house that McDonald lived in. As you point out, and I think, you know, you can, you can probably explain this in more detail. This is about pushing the ideological message that Johnny McDonald is someone that we should be ashamed of in this country and not at all someone that deserves recognition. It's almost as if Bellevue House itself the structure, you know, is sort of is sort of a, a problem for the uh, for the historical rewriters at, at Parks Canada, and so they decided to fill it with all of this anti-McDonald and, and what I believe to be anti-Canadian messaging. Do you agree with that? Uh, oh, one hundred percent. I mean, it's it's funny. There is such a remarkable lack of historical fact and so much opinion, and it's almost all negative. I mean, just to give an example, on the residential school front, there's a number of facts that most Canadians would be very interested to know. I mean, for example, the fact that most Indigenous kids went to day schools. Always true. It was true before McDonald died. It was true after he died. Always true. Most kids went to day schools, went home to their parents every night. Hard to call that genocide of any sort, cultural or otherwise. 
kids who went to residential schools, which are under half of kids, the average kid went for one year. 50% dropped out after one year. I mean, that, this is not a concentration camp. They're not locked in. They're letting them drop out after one year because if they weren't interested, they didn't think it was worth keeping them there. Now, the reality of the residential schools is they became very much foster homes because alcoholism, et cetera, on Native reserves is so bad. There were so many children in broken homes, suffering family violence, uh, sexual abuse and the like, that the residential schools very quickly became child welfare refuges, which is the old term for, you know, a home for orphans in the old days. Um, and no one discusses that. But the reality is these kids were not um, there was no genocide going on, no cultural genocide. I mean, here's an interesting factoid. In 1915, the Americans sent a commissioner up to study the Canadian Indian school system. And it's very interesting because we looked at their school system back in the 1850s because they were ahead of us in building large schools for Indigenous kids, and they taught them trades. We weren't thinking, uh, we'd had schools for 200 years, a few of them, they're all privately run by uh, charities. Um, but they were mostly teaching academic type material, reading, writing, uh, arithmetic. The Americans were more into trades, and we thought that would be a great idea. And that became a little bit of a theme of our residential schools as we built them in the 1880s and 1890s with the add on this trade issue. But the Americans sent a commissioner up in 1915, so that's uh, 30 years, 25 years after McDonald died, to look at our system because they felt we were doing a much better job of both educating Indigenous Canadians and letting them keep their culture. I mean, it's, it's shocking if you hear that today and hear what people say about the schools. The Americans thought we were doing a great job because the Indians were preserving their culture. And in some of our schools, of course, they converted the uh, Christmas carols into the indigenous language. The kids were allowed to use indigenous language in certain parts of the school. But they were there primarily, remember, and they're only there for a few years, as I just explained. They're there primarily to learn basic reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, and one of the official languages, English or French, so they have some hope of a job, of succeeding in the modern society. And the movement to build residential schools happened around the same time as the movement for public schools. There weren't public schools before 1870. There was no compulsory education. Schools were local. They were funded locally. Um, then there was a very big press from the public to create a, a school system and to have it compulsory, which they made it compulsory for four years. So that was around 1872 in Ontario, it became compulsory. Most kids didn't, still lots of kids didn't go to school. Compulsory didn't mean compulsory. That was the aspiration, not the reality. So that's happening at exactly the same time as we're building the school system for Indigenous kids. And it was for the same reason. People thought they needed the same skill set if they were to have any hope of surviving and not just prospering, but just surviving because there's all kinds of scallywags running around wanting to exploit indigenous people's innocence, uh, you know, sell them liquor, um, sell them stuff at mispriced values and things like that. So everybody felt indigenous kids like every other kid should have some basic skills. Uh, you know, as you point out and several other historians point out that, you know, this was not a program of genocide. The residential school system was not a program of genocide. However, the entire House of Commons unanimously passed a motion saying that the residential school system was genocide. And the federal government said that the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women program is a genocide back in 2016. I don't believe history should be political, but clearly there are many that do. What do you think needs to be done to actually put history in this country and historical education back on the right path and grounded in truth? and not hijacked by ideology, which it appears it has been, and hijacked by politicians. Yeah, it's a tough task. And um, I mean, I'm involved in some discussions at the provincial level in Ontario with people who would very much like to get our historical program back on track. But this has been a 30-year program of slowly removing factual material and skewing the content so that it's more a political narrative that kids are learning in school than basic facts. I mean, as I say, if you had the basic facts in residential schools, you can make up your own mind about whether it's a genocide or not a genocide, cultural or otherwise. But without those facts, you're, you're at a loss. Um, I think many people intuitively know, at least, I guess I may be giving kids too much credit. Kids probably don't know. But, you know, uh, and I grew up in a different era. But for me, these outrageous stories that began 30 years ago, I just intuitively knew they were they weren't true. Like residential schools, I didn't for one thing, uh, second think there was a genocide going on there. And that's what got me digging into the facts. And I went into the Indian Affairs records to check on the 
you know, the attendance records. They kept very detailed records in Indian Affairs. I mean, here's a fun fact. Every member of Parliament from 1870 into the 1920s received a 500 to 1,000 page report each and every year on every aspect of the uh, Indian system, which included the schools. So they, they got the stats on how many kids were in school, what percentage were attending for grade one, grade two, grade three. This information was widely disseminated. Nothing secret could happen anywhere. Uh, I mean, same deal with the, you know, surprising, mysterious deaths at schools. It couldn't happen. You've got 100 kids in a school or 80 kids in a school. Every one of those kids is going to tell their parents some kid disappears. Parents are going to be on the warpath. In you know, Indian parents aren't different from any other parents. They'd be shocked, right. astounded, on the warpath. And in fact, there's, um, and aside from that, there's a teacher, there's a principal. All these people would have to keep their mouths shut. It's not possible. But one of the tasks of the Indian agent, every area of the country had an Indian agent. One of his tasks was to attend the residential schools every month or so and be there for roll call to see that every kid on the roll was present. And the government had a, a simple financial interest in that. They paid per day per kid. They wanted to make sure kids were in school. So the idea that any kids disappeared from schools, there were no stories. There's no facts to back those kind of stories. They're just stories. And yet some of the most radical historians, if, you, if we can even call them that, I mean, they call themselves historians, but some of these people that, that claim to be historians, but are really just, just, you know, really just trying to erase history, they claim that figures like McDonald and Egerton Ryerson were killers and set up and were architects of a system of, of genocide. You've written in the National Post, Johnny McDonald saved more Indigenous lives than any other Canadian prime minister. And while I don't disagree with the with the subject of the headline and the article itself, you know, it is quite a provocative headline. I'd like for you to explain that point, because I think, it, it you know, we're having this conversation about McDonald. Let's hear about some of the good things that he did and, and some of the things that sh he should be celebrated for, not just starting the country. So, yeah, how do you how do you come to that conclusion that he saved more Indigenous lives than any other Canadian prime minister? Well, let's start with a, a simple program that he ran from uh, before Canada existed. We had Upper and Lower Canada and then the United Province of Canada. And he was premier of the United Province of, uh, Province of Canada about uh, 1865, 1866. And he began running, and the British had done some of this before him. They began running a smallpox vaccination program to vaccinate every Indigenous Canadian. Uh, smallpox was a terrible disease at that time, a terrible scourge. Fortunately, a very uh, insightful British physician had figured out that if you infected people with cowpox, a milder form of the disease, they would not get smallpox. And so that, that was the first vaccination ever discovered. And uh, so McDonald's government, both prior to Confederation and then following Confederation, ran a program to vaccinate every Indigenous Canadian. Some years, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 would die of smallpox in the pre-Confederation days. Um, after the vaccination program had been running for a number of years, there was an interesting contrast. The uh, smallpox epidemic broke out in Montreal. Montrealers, for religious reasons, were averse to getting vaccinated. And so uh, Montreal was more exposed to the risk of smallpox. 5,000 people died in Montreal just across the river. It was only like a 30-minute uh, paddle across the river to the big reserve at Kanawaki. There were no deaths because all of the Indians had been vaccinated against it. So just as an example, so that, that program saved many, many thousands of lives, tens of thousands easily. The second program of McDonald's government, and he gets criticized for it, and we'll touch on why he's criticized for it, was the collapse of the buffalo population. So the buffalo were herds of millions that roamed across the American plains and up into the uh, part of Canada on the plains. And there were a, a number of tribal groups that had depended on those buffalo for their food for thousands of years, probably. Um, and they, the herds came around once or twice a year and they'd harvest the herd and, and get food. Well, the intrusion of settlers, uh, there was some climate change going on. There's a lot of reasons scientists haven't concluded exactly why the herds collapsed. They were being overhunted, but they were huge. The overhunting probably wasn't the main problem. Climate change might have been or competition with cattle who were now roaming the same plains, huge herds of cattle. Um, the buffalo population collapsed and it had been expected for about 10 years, but it suddenly happened about 1879. McDonald had to immediately launch easily the biggest um, relief program in Canadian history. There's no there's no railway to the West. Picture that 
all the food supplies and everything else are in eastern Canada and the eastern U.S. How do we get them to the West? I had to ship them down through the states, partly on railways, partly on boats, partly by wagon train to get the food to uh, Western Canada. At the uh, peak in the next year, there were more than, uh, most people estimate, 10 to 20,000 indigenous Canadians were being kept alive by these famine relief supplies. And um, after a year or two, things started to settle down a bit more. People started to adopt other ways of living. Um, the food supply got better. But uh, even his harshest critic, Dashik, who wrote the book Clearing the Plains, was very critical of MacDonald in general, acknowledged that he avoided a catastrophic uh, death toll from famine. So that's a, a second thing. And the third thing um, MacDonald did, and this went on, on over a period of time, in the States they had a series of Indian wars that went on over more than 100 years. And estimates are that about 60,000 Indians were killed and about 40,000 settlers and American soldiers were killed in those Indian wars. Canada wanted to avoid that and Britain wanted to avoid that. And uh, MacDonald's policy was to uh, enact treaties with all the Western tribes. Remember, all of Western Canada was picked up when we bought Rupert's Land. That had been a British problem previously. Um, so his, his program was to get treaties in place before he allowed any settlement of Western Canada. He did that, and there were no Indian wars in Canada. And we had a good track record before that because the British policy generally was to avoid Indian wars as well. So throughout Canada's history, there were essentially no Indian wars. So we didn't have 100,000 deaths um, on the Indian side. We didn't have 60,000 deaths on the settler side. So these three policies of his really had a significant impact on Indigenous Canadians and are responsible for my headline saying he saved more Indigenous lives than any other prime minister. And not one of those facts, I believe, made it to Bellevue House. There is plenty of space on the walls, <laughs> plenty of opportunity to talk about those things, but I couldn't find one of those being presented, uh, one of those facts being presented at Bellevue House at all. And, uh, you know, we appreciate you sharing some of those convenient facts for us and, and rather inconvenient for the ones who try to rewrite our history. Uh, Mr. Piazetsky, we thank you so much for joining us on the show. If you want to find and read more about Piazetsky's uh, uh, trip to Bellevue House, you can do so by going to C2C Journal and finding the article, Parks Canada Tries to Cancel Sir John A. Macdonald in His Home, in His Own Home, and a link to that you can find in the description of this video. Once again, Mr. Piazetsky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.